the Forgotten Soldier, Guy Sager, third part, chapter eight. The breakthrough at Konotop. We drove for an hour, which meant about 30 miles, before it grew dark. We were all anxious to stop so that we could get rid of the thick, choking dust which coated us from head to foot. We were also exhausted and longing for sleep. Although a good bed in a warm barracks would have been a paradise, any place where we could have stretched out and lost consciousness would have done. And we knew that when we did stop, we would collapse onto the ground and sink immediately into blackness. The dark sky was filled with heavy black clouds lit up on their outer fringes. Large drops of rain began to fall as the storm broke. The rain, so often a curse, seemed like a blessing this time, washing off the filthy faces we turned up to meet it. It soon became a downpour, running down our collars and over our bodies. Like a gift from Providence to friend and foe alike, making us all smile with the sense, however partial, of returning well-being. The soaking cloth of the uniforms on our tightly packed bodies clung to all of us. Gray-green for the Germans, violet-brown for the Russians. We all grinned at each other without distinction, like players from two teams in the showers after a match. There was no longer any feeling of hatred or vengeance, only a sense of life preserved and overwhelming exhaustion. The rain became so heavy that we had to improvise shelter and cover our heads and shoulders with our ground sheets. Although hardly anyone understood more than a few words of the other language, we were always laughing and trading cigarettes. Hanover cigarettes for Morcharka tobacco from the Tartar plane. We smoked and joked over nothing. A nothing which in fact represented the most absolute human joy I had ever known. The exchange of tobacco, the smoke under the ground sheets, which made us choke and cough, and the simple fact of laughter without reserve. All of this made a small island of joy in a sea of tragedy, which affected us like a shot of morphine. We were able to forget the hate which divided us as our stupefied senses reawakened to an awareness of life. Understanding nothing, I laughed uncontrollably as a curious sensation took hold of me and filled my veins. Suddenly I was covered with goose flesh, as one is during a particularly moving piece of music. The rain was beating on the metal hood. Would we have to shoot our Russian fellow passengers tomorrow? That seemed impossible. It was impossible that such things could continue. We had just caught up with a regiment of motorized cavalry, stopped in the middle of nowhere. Streams of water were running down every exposed surface, the dull finish of the sidecars sheltering under the dripping leaves of the trees at the edge of woods glistened with raindrops. Vaisadadao climbed down from his sidecar to talk to the cavalry commander. The fellows in the sidecars had long oil skins, which pretty well covered them and kept them more or less dry. However, all their camping equipment was in the trucks of the supply column, so instead of sleeping, they had to spend the rest period tramping up and down through the puddles. Two fellows distributed bread, a stale sausage for each German, and loaves of bread to be divided among eight. There was no food for the prisoners, whose rations in theory would be provided by the division. We thought of walking off a short way to devour our meager portions, but we were bunched around our dripping communal plates. The Russians, who had nothing but their lives, kept their feverish eyes fixed on the food, which was impossible to hide. Finally, our torn and filthy hands broke the hard bread and held it out to the men who had been trying to kill us only a few hours before. 
Our stomachs were still rumbling with hunger five minutes later as we swallowed down the last mouthfuls of our rations. Everyone was thirsty, and our water bottles had been emptied after the fighting. Like feverish sheep, we needed water. We had obtained permission to leave the trucks to relieve ourselves, but for no other reason. We were in the middle of wild, uninhabited country, and there were no parekas or drinking trucks. However, the rain was still pouring down, and we collected the runoff from the back of the trucks and the leaves and the puddles and the oil cloths. When we had quenched our thirst, we left with the cavalry regiment. Finally, this rain stopped, leaving us chilled and bone-tired to the misery of our throbbing machines. Lightning was still streaking through the sky behind us and over our heads, and the thunder was still rumbling. Ahead, there were other flashes, too, which unfortunately had nothing to do with the storm. These were produced by Stalin's organs, firing at the division block behind Konotov. As we drew nearer, we were able to gauge the size of the battle by the intensity of the fire flashing across the horizon. Soon we also could hear the loud and continuous sound of the guns. We had been hoping for a refuge where we could spend the night. Instead, we were faced with the anguish of a fresh hell and a fresh uncertainty of survival as war tightened its vice-like grip once again around our throbbing temples. The young face of the blonde boy who had played the harmonica a short time before hardened suddenly into the face of a man. Was it exhaustion, or did he simply want to get it over with? In the space of a few moments, he suddenly aged 20 years. We arrived at the town, which was black and deserted, intermittent flashes from the battle being fought somewhere to the west of us. Through the outer fringes of the town lit the, the darkness. The thunder of explosions filled the air, shattering window panes and breaking off the gutters of the houses all around us. The rain had begun again, falling in small, delicate drops. We were ordered to leave the trucks and jump down like sleepwalkers. The shock of contact with the ground reverberated through our numbed bodies and we felt sickness rising in undulating waves along the entire length of our spinal columns. In a herd, we followed our leaders while the trucks drove off to a nearby street. I could feel the sleep weighting down my eyelids and only half awake staggered like an automaton after the sound of the boots of the fellow in front of me without grasping that I was going back into battle.